freedom to do games myself. And so I managed to do that as a job whilst flash games were popular. And that, when that started to turn into mobile games, I wanted to do bigger and better games. And that was the opportunity to say, look, games can be something um, more than what web games were. They can be separate and they can be self-contained and they can be bigger and have greater ambition. And at that point, that's when I set up State to Play Games and I employed a proper programmer. Um, still kept the team small so that we had creative control and didn't have too many expenses. Um, but that's, that's the history, basically, and the, like in terms of inspiration. Um, throughout that time, um, it was a period of awakening, I suppose, of um, rediscovering a lost love of computer games. Like, um, I'd obviously grown up with them, I think maybe we all, we all, we all have. Um, and it was that point where, you know, Eco, Shadow, Shadow of the Colossus were showing us that these games could be more artistic um, and that became the driving ambition of the company to stay independent and um, keep producing creative and innovative games. Um, for me it started with uh, Adobe Flash 2. Mm, except as a programmer. Um, I was studying computer science. I, I guess a lot of people here studied or are studying computer science sciences. And I hated it. Uh, I wasn't that bad at it. I understood it, but like it was really boring for me coding compression algorithms that had already been programmed hundreds of times by other students. And we had that teacher. He was supposed to teach us animation. Uh, and he gave us, uh, it was a uh, Flash CS3 at the time. And I was like, I entered 10 lines of code and then I press enter and I, I had my little red ball jumping. And it started there, it really started there for me. Uh, the instant gratification of uh, making something yourself and toying around with it after a while. Uh, that's when I realized I wanted to make games. So I completed my bachelor degree with a, a game programming spe specialization. Um, I started working as a game programmer, working on Flash Game 2, because at the time uh, there had a lot of work in that field, and it was, um, it was a nice position to have. And after a little more than a year, I went back to school uh, because I realized I liked making game, but I was not a great programmer. I had, like, rich my limits as a programmer. I was meeting a lot of programmers younger than me that were way better. And I, I realized I loved helping these people with what they did not understand. So I went back to school and I became a producer. Because that's how I always saw the job of a producer, is here to uh, make sure everyone can focus on what they know how to do. So I went to Engmin, which is a school in France. Uh, it's very particular Engmin because it's like the only one in France, and I think in Europe, school where you can get for free if you can pass the entry test. So it's uh, the school everyone wants to get into. I wasn't sure. Um, I took it a year at a time, you know. I was like, maybe I will go to Engmin. If I don't, I will go somewhere else. And I had the luck to get in. I spent two years there, and after that, I got a job at Ubisoft, uh, which was like the next step. I was a producer at Ubisoft. I was having a lot of fun. Up until the time, I hadn't. Uh, and uh, I decided now I want to go back to making game myself. I don't want to be a little gear in a big machine. I want to have a team of six people, and I want all of us to have a lot of fun. Fortunately, i had been working on Event Zero with my friend for the past couple of years, so we decided the timing was right and we needed to jump on that train. Well, uh, if any of you expect like a wonderful story that I was born thinking about being a developer or game maker, it's not true. It's actually, I never planned that. But that's the cool thing about life, that you don't plan greatest things because they just happen on the way. So I was 19 years old, I quit my first studies, and I didn't have any idea what to do with my life next. And I found out that it was like 10 years ago. Uh, it was like, well, there's a company in Poland doing game, The Witcher game. And back then, like 10 years ago, like Polish industry wasn't so strong. No one has heard about it. And no one has heard about The Witcher, despite Polish folks. And I said, well, that would be really 
kinky stuff to do, like work in a game, the Fantasia RPG game that no one has heard about. And that will be an interesting topic to discuss during family dinners, because you know, all your family members expect you to be a banker or a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. And I said, okay, fuck it, I'm gonna be a game developer and my grandmother gonna ask, but what are those games? Like, what is it all about? And I'm gonna tell her about it. And so I just sent my CV and apparently they were desperate enough to hire me. Uh, <laughs> And that's how it started. And from then, I worked for the on the first two Witchers, and then I moved to Berlin to work for GameForge, which is like the one of the biggest free-to-play companies in the world. And then I got back again to Poland because Poland is awesome. Uh, and after that, I got to the LMB Studios because I used to work in the peer agency. And peer agency is a fun thing, but on the other hand, you never do stuff you like to do because you do stuff you're being paid to do. And I wanted to get to the roots to do some stuff that I really gonna be proud about. And that's where I found myself in 11B Studios. Because they are making games and they're, even you know, they're successful so that it's still all about making games, not making money. Because if you do a good game that you're proud of, then the money comes after that. And that's, the, that's my idea for life as well. So that's why I end up here with this world of mine. Thank you. É, eu vou começar a fazer umas perguntas individuais. É, eu vou fazer uma pergunta agora para o Leonard, da Event Civil. Okay. É, Leonard, é, eu gostaria de saber quantas pessoas é, trabalharam no seu jogo e é, qual, quão, quão difícil foi isso. E uma pergunta de curioso, assim, quantas linhas de código tem na inteligência artificial da, do computador? Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, it started as a student project. It was Enjmin second year, so um, second year of master degree uh, project. And uh, this project have 10 people working on them. Uh, 10 people, including like myself, I was a producer, and we had two programmers, two graphic artists, two game designers, two sound artists, dedicated sound artists, uh, and a user expert uh, working full time on the project. So at first that, w that was it. We even had um, a couple of friends working on the music of the game, so that make 12. And a Canadian student that was in an exchange program uh, worked on the room of the game too. So that like 13 people worked on it on the first prototype of the game. Uh, right now we have a team of a core team of four to five people. Uh, Oslo Society uh, is going to be six people with some of them like the sound artists that we can retain, we can hire uh, full time. That's going to keep their day job at Ubisoft, uh, not to mention it, um, and uh, work for us on a small contract as freelancers. So we scale down to uh, from uh, 13 to 6. Uh, I have no idea how many lines of code are on the IE of the game. I actually never wrote a single one of those. Uh, I wrote some of the code of the game, a little bit, but not that part. Uh, it's way too complicated for me. That's what I said about not being a great programmer. Um, and you, you asked for the uh, difficulties of, of the team. Well, the I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky because I had a great team, a team of people that are really good at what they do, uh, that do it very well, and that motivated by it. So I never had, it, was, it started a student project, but I never had to uh, push them to do it. Everyone was there in the morning and making uh, overtime in, in the night. Everyone was rushing um, when we had to deliver a milestone. So um, I'm very lucky. I did not have significant challenges on that. I can mention one, though, because I think that's a challenge not a lot of producers face in their life. Uh, one day, a game designer came to me and said, Leonard, I have a problem. Maybe tomorrow I go to war. Uh, because he's Ukrainian, and war just broke in Ukraine. And in Ukraine, if you had your uh, super education paid by the country, you end up being a reservist. And any day, they can just give you a call, and you have to pick up your things and go. So we had to walk like a month and a half with that. Every day we had to, uh, we didn't know if he was going to show up or not. And that, that was a difficult challenge. And that's the kind of things you do as a producer because he was still walking, he was still here with us. But uh, you could see it was like on the morale of all the team, it was really difficult. And like you just bring orange juice and uh, 
uh, little uh, candies to everyone every morning and you hope for the best. <laughs> That's the producer job for you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for all of you. Uh, Carol mentioned uh, The Witcher, the beginning of the game scene uh, on Poland, and all of you uh, are from different countries. Yeah. So, how's the game scene around your region, your city, your country? Uh, it's how's the. I think you you traveling you traveled enough to, to different countries to different uh, between um, uh, game scenes. So, how's uh, what's the specifics around the? Well, actually. During the last 10 years, the Poland industry grew like not any other industry in the Europe because, you know, 10 years ago we were making just a few simple games like some people noticed, but right now, w each year there are like three to four big titles like, you know, like The Witcher, Dying Light, Bulletstorm. And in the last five years, you had like the, a lot of blockbusters that were actually made in Poland. And that's awesome because we, you know, in, we, well, the thing is, like, you know, Hollywood took movies and English people took books, so we had to invent some niche for us. So we did, we decided to do games. And we're, it turned out we are really good at that. And when you go to Warsaw, which is like the capital of Poland, like, there you have like at least five or six big studios that make AAA titles. And you have like dozens of small studios that do mobile games, online browser games, and all of them are quite successful in, the, in their niche. Now, we have the companies that make RPGs, FPS, we have companies that make Hoppa games and that make some puzzle crafts and stuff like that. So the cool thing is that even we are a smaller country than the other and maybe not so rich, like Germany, for example, uh, our potential is much bigger and we deliver much more games than any other country in Europe right now because like Germany, they have a great history of some developments, but right now, not a single good game in Ger was made in Germany in the last like few years. And in Poland, you know, we, our game came out this year, like The Witcher came this year, and there will be Cyberpunk, and there will be another Dying Light and stuff like that, so all this happening right now. Uh, and I think it's, it's a good thing, you know, for all the Polish people, because actually we had this little problem that we are always looking at other countries, that they're, you know, they're good at something, right? They're good at science, they're good at sports, and our football is really shitty. So, you know, we, we are always, always happy about, we, we are so proud about our Polish football team, but they don't win anything, so like in Brazil. Uh, so, finally, we find something that we are really good at and we are proud about. And that's a great thing, because we, it's built like the strength of the country itself, because luckily, you know, when you go abroad, you know, we go to States, for example, and say, you know, we are from Poland. Oh, the country that made those games. And that's really awesome. I mean, for me, when I went to Los Angeles, like I think seven years ago, it was like Poland, Poland, wh where is that place? And right now it's different. Right now, when you tell you are a developer from Poland, everyone knows where is that. And that's awesome. Um, the industry in France is has a long history. We had um, like the very old, in the 80s, we already had some small studio, some name you may have heard of, people like Frédéric Renal, Eric Chahi. Um, so it's really old. But right now, it's, well, we have Ubisoft, obviously, so we have this really big publisher giving job to a lot of students going out to school and making some interesting games, some less interesting games, that's like your opinion. Um, that's mine. Um, <laughs> And you have, since you have this big publisher hiring a lot of people and keeping only some of them afterward, you have all these people that had education in games, uh, first work experience in game, um, and now are looking for a job. And since they don't have that many jobs, they end up making studios and creating jobs. So uh, having a big publisher uh, like that in, um, in an area, it always spawns a lot of small uh, studios, and that's really healthy, I think for an industry. So I think French industry is kind of okay. I'm lucky enough to be there. Yeah, I think the British industry is probably quite similar and has a similar uh, history. Um, it goes back to, uh, yeah, Peter Molyneux. <laughs> like, old, we, have, we have sort of an old guard of, uh, uh, like, an older generation of famous game designers, David Braben, Peter Molyneux, um, Charles Cecil, and, and it's... Um, it's given a good grounding to everything, especially now those people are they're coming back and uh, they're reissuing their games or they're you know Peter Molyneux is still making new games. 
and uh, it, there is everything in between in the UK as well. There are small-time indie developers. There are you know there are um, people making money in their bedroom like there are all over the world. Um, there are you know there are lots of middleware companies. There are lots of you know there are medium-sized companies. There are there are quite a few jobs out there uh, if you want them. And there's a very friendly indie community as well, um, where it's, it, it feels like a very positive thing to be part of. Everyone is sharing their ideas and everyone is sharing, um, helping out. Everyone meets up at, l at least once a month, um, in London at least, um, to share their latest games ideas and talk through um, you know, what, how they could be improved. Um, and there's no real sense of competition. Um, and so that makes it a very positive uh, space to be in at the moment. Bom, no, no Brasil, se pegar oito ou até um pouco menos, seis a dez anos atrás, tinha um ou dois jogos que eram um pouco maiores assim, mas daí tinha um cara que vinha criar uma empresa, arriscar para criar um jogo, né? E, e no Brasil não tem profissional com experiência, não sei que ele queira, que ele quisesse contratar de fora. Aí era bem mais difícil de aparecer jogo, então acho que no Brasil começou esse desenvolvimento mesmo, vou dizer, nos últimos 4, 5 anos no máximo, principalmente por causa da facilidade de se publicar um jogo hoje em dia, no PC principalmente é mais, é mais tranquilo de publicar um jogo. Então acho que nessa faixa começaram a aparecer mais jogos, é, começaram a aparecer principalmente os estúdios indies de 3, 4 pessoas, até 5, ou até menos, e... E acho que no mundo todo, por causa dessa facilidade de publicação, acho que no mundo todo cresce, foi crescendo da mesma forma. Agora, uma coisa interessante é... Um, um cara na Steam, lá, depois que ele estava jogando meu jogo, ele me perguntou se meu jogo tinha pego uma inspiração é, de outro jogo brasileiro, porque ele viu que nos dois jogos tinha algo que era parecido. Assim. Aí ele perguntou se era da cultura brasileira, de criar jogos com alguma coisa relacionada a isso, mas eu falei, não, não peguei inspiração no, no outro jogo ali, talvez foi coincidência, mas se pegar alguns jogos brasileiros com, focados, com foco em algum tipo de cultura, assim, tem bem mais do que nos outros países. Então, talvez no Brasil, é, o pessoal goste mais de criar jogos assim, com algum tipo de cultura, talvez local ou até de fora, assim, e talvez acabe ficando parecido assim. Mas no mercado índio, eu acredito que cresceu no mundo todo, né? principalmente pela facilidade de publicação. E no Brasil também. Ah, começaram a aparecer vários jogos legais no, nos últimos anos. E eu acho que só vai continuar, os jogos vão ficar melhores. Sim, nos Estados Unidos. É um pouco grande, grande. O game industry realmente really depende where you go, what region, what city you're in. Um, the game industry tends to be very condensed in, uh, uh, condensed into a couple cities, you know, you know um, LA, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Austin. Uh, I actually like, recently moved to New York part-time and I find that like people don't even know what I'm talking about half the time when I mention like a popular game. Like, um, so uh, yeah, it definitely um, is not as ubiquitous in some places as is in others. You know, in Seattle, everyone knows everything about video games. It's just like standard common knowledge. Um, a big change I've seen in the last several years is uh, academically. When I uh, decided to go to game design school in 2009, I had like three choices maybe. Um, and now like most uh, big time colleges have game design programs, which is great. Everything's getting a lot more indie. The uh, barriers of, of entry for um, getting your game uh, on a platform are obviously extremely low. It's pretty much like, make a good enough game and it will get distribution. So a lot of people are uh, kind of more cavalier, less less uh, set in their like, on their path of getting a job at Microsoft or uh, a big established company, more interested in uh, trying to just do their own thing. É, eu vou fazer mais uma pergunta só que eu tenho curiosidade e depois a gente vai abrir para quem tiver dúvidas então já vão preparando as perguntas aí levantem a mão e aí o pessoal vai passando com, com o microfone é, my question is to Luke é, Luke 
tell us a little bit about the process to create the art of your game because it's so unique. So tell, tell us how did you do this? Okay. Um, thanks. Um, it, it almost happened by accident, the style of the art. It, it happened because I'd always made stuff by hand, so I'd always done illustration. And then I, to make things digital, you have to scan it in. You have, it has to go through some sort of conversion process. And what was getting lost was texture and you know, the fact that it was on paper. And so I'd, I'd started some tests um, thinking, oh, I'll, yeah, I'll put a paper texture over it and things like that. And it started to feel like cheating. It started to feel like the opposite of what I was doing, you know, <laughs> like what I wanted. And so I thought, okay, Let's, let, what about if I print it out and then take a photograph of it? And so I, I drew a building and I, I um, printed that out. And then in taking that photograph, suddenly it added depth, it added blur, it added all this extra reality and character to that illustration. Um, and at that moment, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I could build a whole city like this and it, it could be something incredible. Um, and But that... At that time, it was too big an ambition, really. Like, I did try. I tried, like, cutting up an Amazon box and turning that into a house and a city, and it looked awful. <laughs> it was just like, you know, like, it was, like, worse than preschool stand. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, that's proved that I can't do this straight away. Um, or it, it proved how much time I would have to put into it to make it good. So we made a game called Loom, uh, which was, like, the prequel to Lumino City, where I was like, okay, we can now do it. it it's just set in one house um, which which limited the ambition and meant that I could put enough time into it to make it um, look good um, but when it came to the big project um, this is about two years later now after we've learned everything from Loom I was uh, I felt it would be fantastic to involve other people um, because it's uh, it you often work better when you're working alongside someone else. You often feel like that, you know, they're providing little ideas that take you off down some other route. Um, and I was really interested in architecture at that point. I was going to some architecture gallery, uh, shows in London galleries. And um, I discovered an architect who um, made models with laser cutting. Uh, a lot of architects do that to, you know, um, just to practice you know, so they can get a visual of how their final uh, house will look. Um, and I saw the potential of that to make a video game environment. It allowed us to do uh, incredible detail. You know, we have little working mechanisms, little pulley systems that are one centimeter high and, and they work. Um, and working with, I, I worked with that architect over the about three months to, to sketch and just go about this in a in a whole new way. We did, I didn't put any pressure on giving a deadline at that point because it was so much fun and I knew that it was important to give that space. Um, and like it just spiraled from there. It, uh, we then needed proper model makers. Um, we then realized like we would need a robot motion control camera to use. Um, I wanted to do all sorts of um, effects with that. Uh, it was that's still pretty expensive, although the technology is is just about affordable. I mean, it's with a robot control arm. I think it costs uh, in U.S. dollars. It would be about four thousand dollars per day um, to rent, <laughs> and so I couldn't I couldn't think of any other way to do it. And so I thought, right, well. I'm just going to save all my money, and we. But it gave us one day to film that entire game, so we, that was a big pressure day. That was like one of those. Okay, I'm going to wake up at four in the morning, and I'm just going. You know, I don't think I slept for you know, 24 hours, um, and we got it done. And I still, it's one of those times when you look back and you go, "How did I do that?" I like. I, it was a good lesson that you can kind of do things that are stupid ideas <laughs> really stupid ideas and like no publisher would it 
invest in <laughs> this stuff. If, if you had to try and pitch this as an idea, oh yeah, we're going to work on it for a year, and it all comes down to this one moment like, where we're going to spend all our money, and if, if we get one thing wrong, we have to start, you know, <laughs> we have to start all over again. And uh, so the, uh, it's just ridiculous self belief that gets you through it. And that, it, um, yeah. <sighs> it, it may it could have gone wrong, but there's a there's a there's a strength in in that belief, and yeah, there you go. that's a very long answer, but <laughs> hope that helps. É, temos agora exatamente sete minutos antes do fim, então vamos abrir tipo, para as questões do público. Todos de vocês. É, about, uh, é sobre o tempo que vocês demoraram para desenvolver, né? um resumo geral de quanto tempo demorou para desenvolver o jogo, é, o tamanho da equipe de vocês e vocês já estão ganhando dinheiro com isso e como vocês estão distribuindo o, e como foi pago esse projeto? Né? Foi do bolso de vocês ou vocês tiveram algum investidor por trás? Não, para todos, por favor. É só um resumo, um resumo. Uh, okay, so in case of this world my the development took around t two years, which is like quite a long time, but obviously we had to do a lot of research. And in terms of making money, yeah, it does. It does make money, it does make a lot of money. And actually it took only one weekend after the premiere to return all the cost of investments. So we released the game on Friday, we get to the party, and we, we returned hangover on Monday. It was all got, we made enough money to cover all the costs. So since that day, and that was in November, all the money we make additionally is our, you know, income. So, yeah, if we make a good game, we can make a good money on that. And the team is around 40-some people, but it's divided to different projects. With this one of mine, it was, let's, the core team is around 12 to 15 people. So, <coughs> sorry. I already answered for the size of the team. Uh, the game the current set of the game is like three years in and out, uh, mostly uh, after hours time. Um, and uh, what was the last part? Oh yeah, it's not profitable because it's free. The <laughs> <laughs> this game, anyone could for a period of time of like maybe six months, you could just send us an email and you could, you would have gotten a download link and you've been able to play it. Right now we have cut on that because we are looking into making it a bigger game uh, commercially. A commercial bigger game, so we stopped distributing it for free, but uh, we did not make a single penny of it. And right now, we started working full time based on our economy, on our economies of uh, working in the industry for big studios. So we keep our team small, like I said, like three people, um, and we work in an art studio which has very low rent. So there's not much financial pressure on us um, working on our games. Um, but yeah, we did overall work with about 12 people on Lumino City, but we kept it to like uh, just those times when we needed them. So that three months work with the architect, then later on with the model makers, and um, it still went over time. It, I think, and and therefore budget. I think I'd planned for a year and a half, and it took three years. Um, so what we actually had to do was make a game in the meantime, a smaller iOS game, which helped fund the rest of it. Um, and that also gave us a good sense that we were actually doing something. And because I, the programmer that I was working with, I realized he'd been working with us for a year and a half and hadn't released anything and had nothing to show for his work. So um, gave him, that gave him the satisfaction as well to keep going. Um, so Lumino City, since it's launched, has now covered all its costs back um, and it's so it's now from now on uh, everything is profit and we um, so and, our, and that's our wages are paid we you know it's not like tons of money it's just is it's, it's just enough um, but that's the good thing that now everything it, it's out there and whatever we do with it now for example it's coming to iOS in September um, and all that is therefore um, profit for us and we'll, we'll be, can be invested in the next game 
Bom, como eu tinha falado antes, eu desenvolvi sozinho e não tive nenhuma ajuda financeira. Eu desenvolvi por conta própria também. Basicamente, eu não ganhei enquanto eu desenvolvia é, esse jogo. E depois do lançamento, gerou um pouco de lucro, mas... Lucro não, né? É receita, vamos dizer assim. É, mas não, se for pegar o ano todo que eu... Uma média de um ano, mais ou menos, eu passei desenvolvendo. É, lógico que não, ainda não, não atingiu todo o valor que se fosse pegar pelo o meu trabalho, né, que foi o meu tempo de trabalho, que, foi, que seria os custos de produção do jogo. Ainda não atingiu, mas aos poucos eu já estou fazendo mais conteúdo. É, já tenho planos para continuar a divulgação do jogo, até porque eu comecei a, a divulgar o jogo quando ele estava próximo do lançamento. E isso é um pouco arriscado, né? Eu comecei a divulgar, acredito que em outubro, novembro. Chegou lá para dezembro, janeiro, eu já estava lançando o jogo, já estava mandando para as lojas para testar, estava fazendo os testes finais. Então, eu já tinha em mente que no começo não ia ser tão forte assim. Aí, eu estou fazendo agora, por exemplo, um modo adicional para o jogo, vou botar uma demonstração, fazer uma demonstração baseada nesse modo, para continuar a publicação do jogo, a divulgação, e já estou pensando no próximo projeto também. Ah, então, basicamente, eu desenvolvi por conta própria, sem ajuda. É lógico que, ah, digamos, pequenas coisas que eu comprei, que eu adquiri, assim, isso aí foi pago pelo que eu, pela receita que gerou depois do lançamento, mas o tempo de trabalho de, dessa média de um ano, até um pouco mais, ainda não, que é um trabalho que eu continuo e que... No, o jogo, na verdade, foi mais para entrar nessa parte, porque eu também era bem inexperiente né, no desenvolvimento e na publicação de jogos comerciais. É, eu fiz um jogo mais diferente, que seria, digamos, que não tem o um apelo de um público muito amplo. O meu próximo jogo já tem em mente, ah, vou fazer algo com um apelo mais amplo para o público. Então, eu criei esse jogo mais diferente para entrar nessa, nessa área. Um. Yeah. Uh, so we have been in production for almost three years, uh, 15 of us total. Everyone has paid um, enough, you know, to get by. <laughs> and they also uh, also have a uh, percentage of back-end royalties, which helps a lot when you don't have a ton of money to give away. Um, what was the other question? Uh, well, we're still like, uh, you know, six or eight months from release, so we're not profitable at all, but we definitely plan to be. Um, Did I miss anything? Any other questions? Was that it? I think that was it. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, we're we're all bootstrapped. We're completely uh, independently financed, and um, yeah, that's a great thing too. <laughs> um, okay. É que nosso tempo agora realmente acabou. São falta exatamente uns 30 segundos assim de apresentação. Então, a gente só pode agradecer. Thank you.